traits that compose the human mind um, and to figure out how they work, uh, which is to say how they generate uh, behavioral variation uh, within individuals as they encounter different situations and contexts and life stages, uh, and also how they vary between people in a way that results in uh, individual differences, as well as how they vary uh, and produce um, a diverse array of, of outputs uh, as they interact with different cultures and socioecologies. Um, so again, those are the goals of personality psychology. Um, but if you're paying attention, uh, you know, you'll, you'll notice that those are the exact goals of uh, the evolutionary behavioral sciences um, broadly defined. Both are, are actually very imperialistic uh, kinds of disciplines uh, or uh, approaches in, in the sense of wanting to explain basically everything, um, you know, human nature uh, and all of its uh, variations. Um, uh, so uh, yeah, that's what I've been um, uh, trying to convince uh, personality uh, psychologists of. Um, and, you know, I think, um, it, you know, if, 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 if we asked people out there uh, in this audience um, and social scientists in general, what they think of personality, uh, I think certain things would come to mind, right? What do they think personality is? What do they think the study of personality is? Um, and they would probably think of something like the big five or certain lexically defined, uh, you know, trait taxonomies or just more generally a focus on behavioral individual differences. Um, but, you know, I think that the term personality may be misleading and need to be sort of jettisoned and discarded uh, because it makes people think that personality variation is, is different than, you know, uh, phenotypic variation uh, more generally, which is, of course, what, what everyone in the behavioral uh, sciences is, is studying. So, um, uh, you know, the approach I take is to try to, you know, to um, take a sort of theoretically principled ground up uh, kind of approach that is, again, not different from uh, the approach that that all of us here uh, take in the first place. So, sorry, that was a long lead in. David. That was great, Aaron. You may, I have a lot of questions and comments just on that introduction too. So let me introduce myself first. I'm Dave Schmidt. Um, I am a professor of psychology um, and I'm the director of the Center for Culture and Evolution at Brunel University in London, where we're trying to put together a bunch of anthropologists and psychologists and create a mini HBEST to try to solve uh, some of the major problems in the world. So far, so good. I'll let you know how it's working out uh, later. Um, next time we meet perhaps at, in Detroit uh, coming up in 2022. Um, so uh, it, my approaches to personality, really I, I take four, I have four kind of main questions that I deal with. One is, um, are the personality traits that we see and that we measure um, traditionally, can you do that cross-culturally with any kind of validity at all? Um, and by that, I mean, you know, do, do the structures the internal, what, what makes up, say, the trait of narcissism, is that the same around the world? And is it functionally the same? Like, do, does narcissism work the same way around the world? And then ultimately, can you look at around the world and look for average levels of narcissism and say some populations have higher levels than others? And the answer to that that I've come across so far is it's really hard to do any of those things um, for a lot of traits. Um, so for narcissism, like a classic question of narcissism is, would you agree with this statement? If I ruled the world, it would be a much better place. Um, I tend to agree with that, but I'm not narcissistic. Um, but I think that um, that question and answers to that question kind of mean different things and would function differently in different cultural contexts. Um, so that's one of the things I do is, can we move our understanding of personality around the world? And what are some of the limitations on that? Uh, the second thing I try to do is look to see to, uh, if men and women or um, different gender identities have different levels or different configurations of personality traits. In particular, I've done some work finding that um, not just personality traits, but also you know, cognitive traits like mental rotation ability or physical traits like height, blood pressure, waist hip ratios, these vary around the world as to how different men and women are. And a lot of times the differences are bigger in cultures that are more uh, uh, gender egalitarian, have more complex economies, are wealthier, have better nutrition, and smaller in other areas of the world, sometimes referred to as the um, par gender gap, uh, the par gender paradox, um, or the gender gap, depending on what variable you're looking at. And uh, I've, I've done some work in that area, looked at work of others, and, and the general conclusion there for me so far has been, well, it depends on which trait you're talking about as to why men and women are changing. And, and some traits, it's women around the world. So, for example, if you look at um, 
the trait of neuroticism from the big five. Gender differences are bigger in Scandinavia than they are in Sub-Saharan Africa or South Southeast Asia, but that's mainly because women are changing more. Um, women's neuroticism is a little bit higher depending on how you measure it um, in Scandinavia than in other parts of the world and men's tends not to change that much. So the gender difference gets bigger. Well, why is that? Uh, depression works the same way. Why is that? And so I, I tend to try to use some evolutionary perspectives to answer those questions. Uh, the third thing I try to do is try to think how personality is related to mating strategies um, and reproductive behavior and sexual outcomes, sexual risk taking, sexual health. Uh, take that an evolutionary perspective on those sorts of questions. And then finally, of late, I've been really trying to um, understand how different gender identities and different sexual orientations from a dimensional multifactorial perspective, different reproductive strategies, different gender role orientations, so how masculinity and femininity vary around the world, uh, and also um, looking at uh, differences of sexual development um, and how those are kind of natural experiments, helping to triangulate and figure out why sometimes men and women differ in their psychological traits and where those differences come from, what aspects of development um, and uh, hormonal exposure or activation uh, make the differences bigger and smaller. And so those are the four things um, that I tend to focus on. In each case, you know, I try to take a very heavily, you know, hormonal development um, adaptationist, but also not, not all adaptations are present at birth. When do they come online? Why do they come online? Um, and that perspective on personality traits. Very well. Well, thanks for these uh, very informative introductions. So I've prepared a few questions, uh, and I don't expect all of you to try to answer all the questions. Maybe for every question, maybe one or two of you, uh, if they want to volunteer. So um, in my institution, the University of Chicago, personality psychology is not taught, and there's no research on personality being conducted. It's just not a popular subfield. So the question I'm, I want to ask some of you is in your opinion, what is the current status of personality research within psychology and the current status of evolutionary personality research within evolutionary psychology? Can one person maybe volunteer and try to answer this question? Aaron, I know that you're ready to I mean what's the status of personality uh psychology within the, the broader field of psychology um i mean i think it ha personality psychology has a lot of different um sort of identities and hats that it wears um and there are you know there are different research traditions in standard personality psychology uh that have fundamentally different kind of goals um uh, description uh, and prediction and explanation, for example, are all you know totally different, only partially overlapping goals. Um, you know to explain you know uh, descriptively how people uh, seem to vary according to you know the human lexicon. Um, to just come up with predictive, typically at this point, machine learning based kinds of models for how can we just predict stuff, predict future outcomes and so on. And that's, you know, has, has a lot of relevance to applied work in personality. Um, and then there's the explanatory part, which is really, you know, has a lot of overlap with basic uh, social cognitive um, kinds of approaches and, and objectives. Um, I mean, I, I think at this point, um, personality psychology is is coming back together with social psychology, right? After the sort of 1960s uh, Michelian schism, uh, uh, where they kind of branched into different uh, subfields within the broader umbrella of social personality uh, psychology. Um, the status of, uh, of of personality psychology within evolutionary psychology, um, I don't know. Uh, you know, I, I think uh, everyone, as I said, I think everyone is studying um, behavioral uh, variation, psychological universals and behavioral and cultural variation. And so I think everyone is either everyone's doing uh, personality psychology or no one's doing personality psychology, but I'm not sure which is uh, more. Do correct. you feel that more people in F psych are studying personality now than they were uh, 20, 30 years ago, that research on personality is growing within evolutionary psychology? I, I can <clears throat> get a bit to that. Um, I think in psychology, there, from what I'm to understand and what I see, what I've heard, there's very, very few departments that have strong personality groups in them. 
Uh, Edinburgh is one of the few. There's like Minnesota, um, oh God, I think Northwestern, uh, just a couple of them. It's not, um, you know, you'll have one or two personality psychologists. Um, but what I'm seeing or what, what I've seen going on for quite a while is like in uh, behavioral ecology and biology departments, it's absolutely just flourishing. So if someone, young person came to me and said, oh, I really want to study personality and I don't care if they need personality in humans, personality in animals, I say, you know, get a degree in evolutionary biology and get yourself, you know, into one of these many groups that are studying uh, personality within that area, because that's where just tons of work is going on right now. Yes, Julia. Just probably a different perspective from Europe, because I think personality psychology is somewhat different in Europe than it is uh, in the United States. So in Europe, or at least in Germany, it's usually related with um, psychological assessment. So also a lot of methodological research and approaches. Um, and almost every psychology department also has a personality psychologist or probably two. So I think it's pretty common here. And um, the feeling that I get or reactions that I get from outside are that um, personality psychology is actually a pretty strong field using strong methods like um, large panel data, a lot of um, participants, large samples, um, but also very sophisticated methods in like statistical modeling, for example. And um, also, I think that um, personality psych psychology is a pioneer in open science practices and brings open science practices to other parts of um, yeah, psychological research. So I think, at least in Europe, um, personality psychology has a rather strong position inside of like the whole broad psychological field. Yeah, if, if I just may add one little thing, what you said about methods and sample sizes, that is one of the reasons why personality psychology is one of the few areas within psychology, that and behavior genetics, which has been virtually untouched by the replication crisis. Most of the effects, you know, even way, way back when, replicate just fine in, in modern samples. Maybe not all of them, but you know, quite a lot of them that were, you know, based on large things, you know, you have no problem replicating them, replicating these things. Very well. Let me let me ask you this now. In your opinion, what, what has been the most important conceptual breakthrough or the most exciting empirical finding in evolutionary personality research in the past 20, 30 years? And don't be modest. You can mention your own work if, if you think that it deserves it. Well, I think one of the, um, as, as was mentioned earlier, personality is a lot of things. And there are a lot of sub-disciplines. Um, both cross-culturally, you see different departments. Like it's true in the UK as well. All psychology undergraduates have to take an individual differences module, which is heavily personality and, and assessment. Um, so it's thriving, but um, there are also traditions within personality of studying motivation, and there's a whole motivational psychology component, and that's kind of matured from an evolutionary perspective. There have been quite a few um, reconceptualizations of approaches to motivation, fundamental motivations, and the, in my mind, that's one of the exciting uh, developments is an evolutionizing of motivation and goals, even a little bit on, there's another branch of personality that's about uh, narratives and personal narratives and how these drive people, how they understand themselves and their life stories. And these have been evolution, evolutionized to some extent as well. So, uh, and then just to fall back one point, yes, personality is the most replicable, has the highest replication rates um, among the psychological and medical sciences. So um, in that sense, it's relatively healthy. We don't know what those findings mean, but they will replicate uh, like crazy. Yeah, <laughs> at least within their respective cultures. Yeah, <laughs> right. So is, uh, is the big five, for example, becoming less popular in evolutionary personality research? Well, what do you think, Aaron? Is that where the field is going? Uh, a new conceptualization of what personality is uh, beyond the traditional questionnaire-based approach? 
I, I mean, I hope so. I think um, there's a lot of consensus now, even among traditional personality psychologists. I just wrote a paper with, I don't know, more than a dozen of them uh, in the European Journal of Personality, um, arguing that, I mean, none of us agree on basically anything, uh, but we do agree on the need to get beyond uh, the big few traits, right? Meaning the big five or the big six or the higher order instantiations of those or whatever descriptive, structural, uh, inductively based um, trait taxonomies uh, people have been working with. Um, I mean, this relates to a, a distinction that, uh, that, that I've been drawing recently um, that's very relevant to the approaches people take in evolutionary personality psychology, broadly defined. Um, I mean, so if you look at the human personality, human evolutionary personality research that's been going on for the past 20 years, uh, you know, the, the, the standard approach has been what I call dimensional cost benefit analysis, which is to assume that the psychometrically sophisticated personality psychologists have figured out what the units of analysis are, right? Which dimensions of variation exist and what they mean. Um, and then to start, start there, right? Say, start with the, the big five and say, okay, let's try to look at the costs and benefits of being higher or lower in conscientiousness or extroversion or whatever. Uh, and this was certainly the, the tradition in which I started out, right? And, you know, I mean, seminal papers uh, on, on the evolutionary genetics of personality started out analyzing, you know, the, the, the G factor for intelligence and the big five um, personality dimensions. Dan Nettle had a uh, landmark uh, paper back then as well, um, sort of describing this approach. Um, but, you know, this dimensional cost benefit analysis approach, uh, I, I think, suffers from the limitation that uh, the ontological status of these um, these folk lexical descriptive uh, constructs um, are uh, entirely unclear. Right. Um, the, I mean, and, and you really have to kind of get inside the inductive derivation methods um, to understand why, uh, you know, why I think that's true um, for how these things are created. Right. So the standard approach in that's been, you know, that's driven a large percentage of the research in personality psychology for the past 30 years is to take uh, basically a sort of comprehensive set of lexical items, meaning words, uh, adjectives and nouns or phrases uh, intended to capture similar kinds of things, um, sentence level descriptions of, of, of people or behaviors, and then to have a whole bunch of people rated on those terms, and then to use factor analysis um, to try to figure out what are the uh, broad um, uh, orthogonal, which is to say uncorrelated dimensions in factor space, and then use those as kind of marker dimensions. Um, so you wind up with, uh, I mean, there's a whole bunch of arbitrary uh, decision steps that go into, uh, you know, uh, the, the identification of these axes. And then what you wind up with are very broad, heterogeneous sort of sausage factory constructs, um, all of which pertain to, uh, the, you know, the psychology of human uh, uh, description and uh, uh, perception. Um, and, you know, there, there's a big inferential leap made there that if people in general have these words that tend to cluster and correlate in certain ways, that this is somehow identifying a psychological trait that exists as part of the human mind. Um, and how many traits are there in the mind? Well, there are five, um, because that's how, uh, that's what our factor analysis says. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and there's a circularity too, to the inferential process, right? Here, here's all these patterns of correlated trait descriptions. So now we're going to infer that there's a psychological trait that's isomorphic with that, uh, you know, recovered trait factor. And then we're going to invoke that latent psychological construct as a causal explanation for the behaviors that fall on that descriptive continuum. Um, so anyways, um, I, I think that, that you can have a, a principled adaptationist evolutionary psychology of, uh, of, of person perception and description, including the sort of culturally evolved uh, lexicon um, of, of person description within a given ecology or culture. Uh, but, you know, I, I don't think in any way uh, that, that we're cleaving the, uh, the mechanisms that actually regulate behavior at their natural joints. Um, <laughs> Uh, you know, and I, and I think that's that's true in a number of different ways. So the approach I advocate for just briefly is to um, do away with all of that uh, and just try to figure out how the mind works based on, uh, you know, first principles, kind of theoretical approaches, uh, uh, but, you know, cultural evolutionary, socio-ecological, uh, cognitive adaptationist. Uh, and then on the back end, you can figure out, OK, well, what have we explained when it comes to these amorphous lexical descriptive constructs um, that uh, have tended to form the units of analysis uh, in, in the field. But the traditional approach does have some predictive value, right? The big five has predictive value in terms of many different life outcomes. So if this traditional approach is so flawed, 
Shall we do away with all its predictive power? Could, could I just could I just add to that? Um, I really hate to say this, but I, I can't quite disagree more with the general notion, respectfully, of course. Um, <clears throat> I I wrote I, I I actually kind of wrote a paper about this, and I I agree with I agree with the notion that the kind of way things have been done that is a I'm just use the nettle paper as an example, you know, kind of come up with, you know, what are the costs and benefits of conscientiousness or neuroticism and so on and so forth. Okay. I think that's that, I think that's more where the problem lies than the actual taxonomy. I think taxonomy is extremely important to get right. And I also think that just based on all the comparative work that I've been involved with, other people have been involved with, that those taxonomic descriptors are telling you something about the species and their socioecology, whether they're humans or whether they're chimpanzees or whether uh, they're a thing. And, and not just you know, the structure that emerges. Uh, and you get pretty much the same structure, whether you're looking at behaviors, uh, so long as you sample widely enough and um, uh, um, other kinds of uh, descriptors, but, you know, I, I think to get at what kinds of feasible hypotheses one may ask about why there's variation on any of these traits, we have to first understand, well, what the hell is that trait doing in humans and why don't we find it in, I don't know, orangutans or rhesus, you know, why don't rhesus macaques have conscientiousness, but capuchin monkeys have something like it and chimpanzees do, you know, and humans do, but rhesus macaques of other things. So it, it's, bonobos have two kind of conscientiousness-like factors. Um, but the general idea that, that I've been working, laboring under is, you know, you wanna know what these factors are for, come up with some good hypotheses. You want to find out, you know, where do you find them? That is, what species do you find them and what species don't you find them? And how are those species related to each other? And, um, you know, just kind of drawing a phylogenetic picture, uh, you know, kind of the you know, evolutionary tree of these different dimensions. And they don't all show up. I just want to add one just quick kind of fun fact. In chimpanzees, the, it's the, the males who are more neurotic than the females, which is just the opposite finding that you find in humans, which is interesting given, you know, chimpanzee socioecology, but that's bye-bye. So I'm just mainly disagreeing on the kind of throwing away something like the five factor model. Um, but I think looking at it less naively and asking evolutionary questions about the factors less naively is probably more my recommendation. Happy to send the paper to anyone who wants it. It's open access even. I mean, I, by way of reply, I would just say, I, I don't, I mean, I did say that I think you can have a principled uh, uh, approach to studying the, the heuristic mechanisms that generate uh, the le the folk lexical uh, construct constructs that uh, you know that that you know that do have some uh, predictive heuristic utility, right? But those mechanisms are evolvable to the extent that they enable uh, people walking around in the world to ha to, to to achieve anything greater than chance and in, in their accuracy regarding perceiving uh, and predicting other people's behavior, right? It doesn't it doesn't mean that they're going to have they're going to be a, a you know a useful uh, scientific t uh, tool for carving the mind at its functional or mechanistic joints. Um, and you know, just by way of analogy, consider uh, so let's say you're an alien scientist and you come down and you're going to try to reverse engineer the personal computer, uh, and you know you know nothing about uh, computing. So to do this, you have uh, hundreds of people use hundreds of computers and they all rate them on words previously used to describe computers. And then you factor analyze those ratings. Uh, you might come up with factors uh, that you would label something like, you know, speed, uh, aesthetics, uh, you know, uh, affordability uh, and the like, right? But I mean, those factors would tell you virtually nothing about how computers work, uh, what are the computational mechanisms that operate the machine um, and, and how do they work and how do they vary from computer to computer? So, but this is exactly the approach that delivered us, uh, you know, these structural taxonomies of person description. Um, and, and by the way, those do not replicate across, um, uh, you know, different kinds of ecologies um, than those on which they were uh, derived, principally, um, you know, 
industrialized, uh, relatively weird um, uh, societies. Um, when you try to replicate those uh, covariant structures in small scale ecologies, you don't get anything that looks like uh, the big five or anything like this it. would be the Chimane paper. Was that right? That's one of them. Yeah. Okay. That's one of the main okay. ones. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, yeah, no, that, that's, that, that is indeed all that is, does indeed seem to be the case, but my, my thing, you know, I'll just, I'll just hold to that though. I mean, it's, you need to, you need to get your taxonomy, right. And maybe the you know taxonomy will change, but I think one needs to get taxonomy right. Well. Can we briefly mention some exciting empirical findings that have emerged from uh, evolutionary personality research in the past 10, 20 years? Well, I think from a, a cross-cultural perspective, thinking about um, how the big five or other models you know, play out in different cultures to kind of touch back on the previous points that were just argued. Um, the study of, you know, social norms and values um, and how different underlying traits might uh, be manifested and related to mechanisms associated with political values or other social values, personal values um, is emerging. Um, there have been just a couple of papers uh, this past year um, that have taken an evolutionary perspective on those things. I think that's been beneficial. And also linking up personality traits to um, situations, you know, to, to go back to Walter Michel, who we were talking about before, and that, you know, different situations elicit different personality traits and different personality traits select you into usually different situations. But that mapping of the relationship between personality traits and uh, places and states that you find yourself in when you're at a party, for example, um, there have been evolutionary developments there too, and some broader um, personality developments. And then something really new um, that I've been excited about is looking at personality traits as variable, not just across people, but within individuals and capturing, you know, not, not just that some people are more variable on extroversion than others. Some people are just flat. They're not going to change. But that um, the, the cycles and the fluctuations in probably some mechanisms underlying these personality when people fill out surveys, that they might be turned on or activated in people over time for various reasons, situations or cycles. Um, there was a paper just published last month, um, Benjamin Harder and, and Veronica Smith, 2021. They looked at the dark triad traits and daily variations in narcissism and psychopathy. And this was meaningful. These variations are real and they have impact on people. And I think um, looking at that and look at, trying to find an, from an evolutionary perspective, what contingencies of the situation are eliciting these dark triad traits or the dark triad traits are leading to those situations from a functional perspective, I think that's gonna be critical. And it's, it's an exciting development that evolutionists have helped stimulate that these traits are turned on and off. Um, they're not just stable. So to what extent do you think as um, human personality variation evolved to solve problems in the physical or the ecological environment versus to solve problems more in the social environment, problems of uh, mate attraction, for example. In other words, what is the relative role and importance of natural selection versus sexual selection in the evolution of human personality? What do you think? Depends on what you mean by personality. Um, to the extent that we're being broadly inclusive about what that entails, um, all psychological and behavioral uh, variation and cultural variation, uh, you know, being one, being my preferred, uh, you know, domain of personality, uh, uh, then, you know, I think it just depends on what, uh, what aspect of variation you're, you're studying. So both. Yeah, but the reason I asked that question is that, um, when it comes to adaptations about bisexual selection or adaptations to solve social problems, some of these adaptations have a strategic nature, meaning that uh, what's optimal depends on what others are doing. So uh, whereas sometimes to solve problems uh, posed by the ecological environment, how to find food, how you handle the food, uh, there's just one optimal solution to the problem and it's irrelevant what other individuals are doing. So do you see a lot of this uh, strategic variation 
in human personality variation that certain personality profiles seems to be strategies um, to differentiate some individuals in relation to what others are doing. Well, for example, it's been suggested that psychopathy might be an example of that, of uh, a strategy uh, for exploiting other individuals that might be maintained by selection as long as it occurs with a certain low frequency. Yeah, I think you know, there's a lot of great work trying to understand you know, what types of selection are, um, you know, is it balancing selection, frequency depend selection? Um, are the ends being stabilized and cut off on traits like um, the big five? And I think it depends on the trait, but on, on balance, I've found, you know, often you don't find a lot of the telltale signs of frequency dependent selection. You don't find a little bit of bimodality. Um, you don't find that at a certain level, uh, too many psychopaths in a population, it starts to break down, at least in the data that I've seen. Um, so I tend to think by and large, it's it, these traits are, you know, maintained with balancing um, and stabilizing selection. But um, with sexual selection being relevant, it's true, it depends on the, the trait, um, whether that might be relevant. I mean, some traits are going to be more advantageous within one gender than the other. They might be sexually antagonistic where they help in one gender and hurt in the other, but they're may still maintained um, in the population. One of the Interesting, uh, David Geary's done a lot of work recently on um, kind of male vulnerability is one term that he uses for certain traits. Um, in men or in males, they tend not to develop um, when under stress or uh, at, at, in extreme uh, ecological conditions. And this is a sign that sexual selection may be selecting for those things. And he had an interesting paper, I think it was a year ago, where um, he had uh, samples, these are undergraduate students, and males tend to be a little bit better at mental rotation um, in these samples, but um, met male but not female students who were had problems with drug abuse and alcohol had worse mental rotation, but the female students who had problems with drug and alcohol didn't have worse mental rotation. And then the, work, the reverse was true for verbal abilities. And his point of view is this is indirect evidence for sexual selection for uh, those two respective traits. And so there are ways of trying to evaluate whether some of the traits or psychological characteristics that evolutionary psychologists have been interested in are in some way sexually selected. Uh, but mostly I, I don't find uh, persuasive arguments, even for something as much like psychopathy that's classically um, thought of as perhaps frequency dependent. I have a quick question for Yulia. Why is it important to include physiological variables like hormones or maybe even genetic uh, data in the study of human personality? What do we gain from that? Great that you ask. Um, yeah, so actually for me, uh, one of your previous questions, one of the most important breakthroughs was uh, through uh, behavior. Uh, let me think about um, like geneticist um, approaches to study the evolution of personality, because I mean, evolutionary yeah, genetics perhaps can give us a clue about um, which proportion of in individual differences is heritable, which proportion is due to uh, in the environment. And also newer models make it possible for us to model um, gene environment interactions and stuff like that. So we can learn a lot from yeah, these methods and also from physiological methods, uh, maybe about the proximate um, causes of um, individual differences. And I think that's one yeah, important reason why we should study that. Okay, there's a question from the audience now that I'm relating to you. The question is, where or is there a line that divides personality from simply individual differences? Well, I would say probably depends on whom you ask, right? Um, so for me, there's actually not a really clear line um, that divides both because I think individual differences are basically personality, more or less. And I think we shouldn't restrict personality to 
like the big five or a big six or something like that, as has been said before, but also um, motives and attitudes and intentions and stuff like that are personality, at least um, that's what I think. Would you, would you be willing to say anything except cognitive ability? Like probably, G, yeah. Probably <laughs> also, I mean, I would probably also not um, say that individual differences in uh, physical characteristics such as height are oh, yeah, yeah. necessarily personality, but yeah. So Alex, think, you're basically saying that individual differences in IQ, for example, do not, should not count as differences in personality. Is that what you're saying? I, at least I don't think of them that way. Um, there is a... 0.3 correlation between um, general intelligence and openness to experience. So there's yeah some overlap between that, but I've always thought of them those things and um, as different from one another. Um, I guess the, the clear difference I when I think of you know IQ is IQ is an ability, right? You get questions right or you get questions wrong. With uh, personality, it's those kinds of questions. There is no right or wrong answer um, unless you're applying for a job. <laughs> yeah. So, but that that that's probably the primary difference. So it may be, you know, artificial. But um, I'd say that kind of you know personality is, you know, I think of individual differences myself, and like uh, Yulia was saying, it depends on you know, who you ask. I think of that as the sort of broad field in which looking at, you know, human variation in, in traits of various sorts. And since it's largely a thing in psychology, um, that would be, um, you know, kind of behavioral traits and things like that. So individual differences includes cognitive ability, includes all the kinds of personality things, it includes, you know, various motivational things and so on and so forth. So personality is a sort of a subsection of individual differences. Uh, and they're all kind of tied together with you know, psychometrics and measurement and uh, uh, things. But that, that's just my perspective. Well, I remember reading a paper recently in which the authors argued that many personality traits or dimensions are mostly expressed in the context of social interactions or social relationships. So one way to conceptualize personality, at least part of personality, is to think of it as an interpersonal style so it's the way some individual deal with others in relationships and and that's why some personality traits are only expressed maybe in one relationship but not outside of that relationship so if that's true then there are individual differences that that, that fall outside of the social domain that maybe are not necessarily part of the personality construct well what do you think of this idea of personality as being mainly social well, I would disagree. I mean, lots of aspects of personality are social, but you can, you know, be a hermit living out in the woods and be obsessive compulsive about the hut that you built and you're still, and if that's stable, one of the key point is personality is relatively stable over time, not perfectly stable, usually emerges early, um, tends to be stable across situations, but these are all relative things. Um, and although it's true, people often cleave the cognitive abilities outside of that domain. Um, that's not necessarily um, required. And things like personal values and attitudes are sometimes shifted over and like, no, those are different, um, in part because they can change. You know, your attitude, your feeling of what your favorite type of automobile is might, might not be a personality trait. You know, it's not going to be stable, but you could have a value that's thought of as a personality. You, you have a loyalty to Nissan cars because you, you love the, the suspension in Nissan cars. And, um, that could be as an aspect of your personality if you value it. So I, I tend to think of personality as relatively broad, although there are these traditional ways of cleaving it up. And um, certainly a lot of it is social. A lot of extroversion, agreeableness, um, certainly are the interpersonal circle is about our relationships with others. I'm, I just want to say I'm, I'm, I'm once again I'm, I'm always confused by the question uh, of what is or isn't personality or uh, you know or whatever because it, it is I mean you can draw lines wherever wherever you wish to, um, but uh, you know I mean pertaining to the the original kind of question um, you know I think that the line between I, I would not only do away with the line between personality and individual differences I would also do away with the lines 
uh, between individual differences and within person uh, variation um, and uh, cross-cultural variation. And um, I would also do away with the uh, intuitive line that people have between the study of individual differences and the study of uh, human nature and psychological universals, um, the design, the basic design of the human mind. Um, you know, it is, it is the very mechanisms that have a species typical architecture and, uh, you know, and, and, and comprise the functional units of the human mind, um, that vary, uh, have parameters that vary, uh, within individuals and between people, uh, and are supplied with, uh, you know, uh, uh, culturally variable, um, uh, representations and inputs um, that that manifest in you know everything that you might or might not uh, characterize as you know personality variation. So uh, you know I think um, understanding the universal uh, human architecture is has to be a central mission for anyone who cares about the goals of of personality psychology or evolutionary behavioral science. Thanks, Karen. That comment takes us to the second question from the audience, which is. Does an evolutionary approach to individual variation help us understand within individual variation and how? I don't want to talk too much. Uh, uh, <laughs> Go ahead. Okay, so uh, the, 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 it's important uh, to me, um, it's important to note that uh, there's there's much more within individual variation than between individual stable between individual variation on almost anything almost any aspect of psychological or behavioral variation that you can measure or characterize um, right so uh, you know many things that that people typically study as personality about you know eighty to ninety percent of the variation that occurs will be within individuals as they encounter different situations and moments and contexts and so on. Uh, leaving only about 10 or 20% to be explained at the trait level, right? Meaning the, the stable between uh, person level, right? So this has wide ranging implications for all kinds of things. Um, uh, you know, not only what I was saying before about, the, you know, it's the very same mechanisms that regulate behavior within individuals across time uh, that vary to some extent in ways that result in individual differences, um, right? But think about the, the, the frequent claim, you know, the first law of behavioral genetics uh, that, you know, about 50% of, of the variation in personality can be accounted for by genetic differences. Well, if it not that that's not true anymore, right? Because if only 10 to 20% of the variation exists at the level of individual differences, then it might be more appropriate to say uh, genetic differences explain 5% of the variation in, uh, in personality. Um, so anyways, I, I think that's a very, uh, you know, important um, uh, nexus of implications to uh, internalize and explore. Another question from the audience. This one is for Alex, I think. Do non-human animals exhibit personality disorders homologous to those of humans? For example, psychopathy, self-harming or suicidal behavior. And if so, how has this informed our current understanding of personality from an evolutionary perspective? Oh, um, okay, that's a bit, I guess it's a bit of a complicated question. Um, there is some evidence that, you know, we do find that kind of thing. So there have been some papers, um, been some papers out by myself and others uh, that have found relationships between some personality factors that you might you know, expect to find or the, the animal, you know, personality factors that are maybe not found in humans, but are found in non-human animals, but you get an idea with the trait. And, um, you know, things like um, uh, stereotypies in, uh, in captivity, you know, don't know if it generalizes too much to outside, but almost a classic study is the uh, Bursky and Pluchik um, paper from I think 1990. So back in 1978, they um, administered a personality questionnaire um, to you know, ask individuals to rate these chimpanzees at Gombe National Park. And one of the chimpanzees, uh, passion, and, uh, yeah, passion seemed to be a real outlier. Um, she had a very odd profile. Um, I wish I could remember exactly what it was that they found. But in 1990, Passion and her uh, daughter, Palm, uh, started on this um, 
uh, got into this habit of kidnapping infants from other mothers, killing them, and then cannibalizing them. So, you know, there is some connection there, you know, these kinds of extreme traits. If people you know, think of, um, as they increasingly do, um, you know, various disorders, and mostly personality disorders, things like borderline personality or antisocial personality disorder as kind of uh, how can we profiles, you know, people of extreme traits. So your psychopath is, you know, very low in fear, very, you know, very low in neuroticism, very low in conscientiousness, very disagreeable. And, you know, is this the sort of thing almost that you're seeing with Passion and um, her daughter, Pom? Um, I guess you know, kind of the flip side of this <clears throat> is some work that I did uh, starting in 2002. Um, I think I presented this to you, Dario, way back in the day, um, in which we found a genetic correlation between um, the, the dominance factor in chimpanzees. And you can think of that as a collection of traits related to assertiveness, disagreeableness, and um, 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 neuroticism. So they're kind of low, neurotic, you know, low neuroticism, they're disagreeable, they're assertive, you know, they're just kind of, uh, you know, pretty uh, uh, ornery characters. And we found association between uh, this personality dimension in chimpanzees and uh, subjective well-being. And we found that that correlation was due to uh, common genes that were shared between the uh, chimpanzee, but, but common genes underlying both traits. So about 100% of that shared variance between well-being on the one hand, which is assessed with a different questionnaire, and um, dominance was uh, due to shared genes. And in 2000, oh, crike, it's 2005, 2006, 2008, we replicated that finding, me and some people, one of the first collaborative papers I did at Edinburgh, we tested that in a human twin sample to see whether human personality characteristics, you know, specifically those kind of that you'd imagine uh, that are kind of consistent with the, the chimps, we tested whether those characteristics and well-being in this uh, MIDAS sample were genetically correlated, and they were. Once again, at about 100, you know, almost all of the genetic variants in well-being could be explained by genetic variants in these personality traits. And we followed that up one more time. Uh, well, we followed up with orangutans, found more or less the same thing. And then in a more recent study in which we used um, uh, a GWAS approach, so using, I think, uh, polygenic scores and finding that kind of the, the you know, actual genes, if you're you know, doing molecular genetic work, the actual, you know, showing that the actual genes underlying one of these traits, uh, neuroticism in this case, because that's, I think is neuroticism and extroversion, were uh, those again that were underlying um, the gene? You know, the, the, those were the same genes that were um, influencing or related to individual differences in well-being. So, you know, as per you know the evolutionary thing, you, I think you can certainly come up with really good hypotheses as to why these personality and um, psychopathy or well-being associations. Uh, may come about using animal work. So you can you know, sort of step away from the human thing that everyone else knows and kind of get to a blank slate and why do we find this? And that well-being personality correlation is so consistent across data. Uh, we haven't looked at it genetically in every case because we don't have pedigrees for all of our subjects, but I mean, practically every single sample that I, I've looked at, where I've looked at, every time I've looked at that, I find a decent correlation as one would expect between uh, the, the, the personality dimensions like neuroticism and lower well-being. So, don't know if that helps, but that's as good as I get. But the, the, the animal welfare literature is a really good place to look for that. So. Well, I have my own hypothesis about the evolution of uh, dark triad traits and, and some personality disorders, and that is that seem, they seem to be mainly or primarily primate traits. So there are some studies of psychopathy in chimpanzees and Machiavellianism, uh, but you don't find them in other mammals, in mammals other than primates. I, I think what's crucial for the evolution of these traits is uh, high sociality in a species combined with very high within species competitiveness. So there are highly social mammals like the social carnivores 
uh, but but they're not as competitive with each other. They're not as hierarchical as some of the primates are. So this is just speculation, but uh, it might be that these traits evolved only among the primates. You could probably test that. Yeah. With with with, with, with genetic. Uh, I, I, I probably have enough data to test that. <laughs> well, we should talk about. This. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or okay. I can get it. Let's uh, ask another question from the audience. This is from Doug Kenrick. How confident are we that the big five don't replicate in small scale societies? Are there enough studies to trust that conclusions that they don't? David, do you want to answer that? Well, I think Aaron is the expert, but I would just say um, it is the case that um, as you move around the world, different lexicons will generate slightly different versions of the big five uh, as you have lexicons that have fewer words um, sometimes some of the big five don't show up that's been the standard account but lately and aaron can attest to this we've gone into some foraging societies and really had um, different structures emerge it's not just that you know openness doesn't show up and then or conscientiousness doesn't quite work perfectly or or we need the hexaco we need to break off part of agreeableness because humility needs to have its own factor um, it, the problems are a little bit worse than that. Aaron, can you speak? Yeah, um, I mean, I, I think uh, the, the point's well taken that, I mean, there, there are methodological challenges psychometrically uh, in small scale ecologies, and there have only been a few, uh, you know, really detailed studies in, in smaller scale ecologies. Um, but, you know, we've been developing, we, we, you can also see the footprints of this in even, even across a range of relatively weird uh, societies, right? So the Big Five was, you know, for example, was uh, inductively derived and sort of the model was trained on, you know, a sample of predominantly Oregonian housewives in, in the U.S. Um, uh, so very, very weird. Um, and then, uh, in, you know, in, in, in something like that structure, if you squint, uh, you know, tends to show up across a range of different highly industrialized um, societies, right? But uh, but the factor structure, the multi, the, the, the multivariate covariant structure, um, uh, you know, it, it, it becomes, it departs more and more from that as you get, uh, you know, uh, lower and lower in, you know, what we operationalize and conceptualize as niche diversity. Um, and so we've looked at how the, the structure of the socioecology uh, is shaping the covariance patterns um, that are the basis of the factor structures in the first place, uh, and now have a number of replications, including a recent one with, uh, uh, you know, with um, over a million uh, subjects from 115 nations and uh, one with over 7 million uh, 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 participants um, from uh, even more uh, nations than that around the world. Um, and, you know, you get a lot more co-variation in general in lower niche diversity uh, ecologies. Um, and that's a trend that, that seems to continue um, into very small scale ecologies like forager horticulturalists and uh, uh, you know, and, and the, you know, small scale farming societies have been studied. Um, so I, I think, you know, um, I, I just, and again, I, I think the, the project in the first place, we don't care about factor structures if we're not trying to use factor structures to make inferences about the structure of the mind and the structure of, uh, human phenotypic variation. Um, there's no reason from a first principles adaptationist standpoint to assume that, different mechanisms that function to do different things will produce outputs that correlate the same way in different ecologies, right? There's no point in having, uh, you know, functionally specialized, relatively domain specific uh, architectures um, that have a particular functional domain um, if, if, if they're going to, you know, uh, function in a, in, a, in a fixed way across um, individuals and across ecologies, right? Um, there's no first principles reason to expect everything to hang together and a multivariate correlation solution um, the same way uh, in all human populations. Um, and, you know, in fact, we see all kinds of different multivariate configurations emerging, um, you know, especially in very different kinds of ecologies. So, um, but anyways, I, I don't know. Can I ask just, but, of it. yeah, but would you say that the particular configurations in different ecologies are still meaningful for those for those people in those ecologies and revealing for problems that need to be solved and fitness related issues so they're not completely meaningless they're kind of the the way the mechanisms have sprinkled meaning in that particular cultural context which might be pivotal to know absolutely absolutely and this is this is what i mean when i say i think that there is 
great work uh, to be done in, in, in mapping the heuristic psychology um, that generates lexical behavioral descriptors and uh, maps them onto underlying person perception uh, constructs uh, and so on. Um, so it's not to say that, that those are you know, meaningless, uh, meaningless patterns of configuration. It's just to say that if the goal is to try to come up with some kind of pan-human universal uh, uh, personality structure um, and then make inferences about the basic traits that compose human nature, I just think it's a misguided enterprise. Um, uh, you know, and, and the manifest cross-cultural uh, variation, uh, you know, is, is consistent with that. Related to this, there's a question from the audience. Is the notion of personality itself as a folk concept, a human universal? It is? Well, I would say to varying degrees. I mean, uh, in some domains, um, people, uh, in, in some cultures don't worry about people's intentions, for example. They just worry about their behaviors. Moral judgments come from what people do, not what they intended to do. And so in some sense, what was internal, what was your values, what was your reason for doing that behavior is irrelevant. Um, it's only the behavior itself that gets judged morally. And so I'd say how personality plays out, what personality is, might be variable. Uh, but there's also a lot of people in our own society and culture who don't believe in the construct of personality, right? They believe maybe in the biologically based differences in reactivity to the environment, uh, temperament, or things of that sort, or they believe that everything comes from our parents uh, in terms of the effects of parenting styles on development. So I'm not sure that it's universal even within cultures, or is it? Well, what's universal is the existence of folk concepts to describe different kinds of people that exist in that ecology. Uh, and in, you know, in, in many of those pertain to ways in which people uh, behave, right? Um, you know, somebody tends to be, this, it doesn't make any presumptions about like the ontological status of the internal traits that, uh, that generate any kind of regularities that are being referred to. Um, but I mean, even, you know, in, in Don Brown's, you know, classic uh, work on human universals, I mean, you can find all kinds of, uh, uh, you know, person description concepts that are, that he identifies as uh, universals, words for describing different kinds of people. Uh, we have studies, uh, John Patton and, and, and James Zerby and I, uh, uh, you know, have a, have a study looking for, testing for the existence of relatively weird, you know, imported personality concepts in uh, Canambo, Ecuador. Uh, and we find that there's very high levels of, you know, within community agreement in the rankings uh, of people on these um, folk personality concepts, um, you know, specifically kind of gregariousness and uh, self-aggrandizingness or immodesty or something like that, um, that's translated into the indigenous uh, lexicon. So, I mean, I think the existence of like behavioral descriptors uh, and, and sort of trait descriptive you know, words and, and so on is, uh, I'm convinced that that's provisionally convinced that that is a uh, human universal, yes. So you're saying that a lot of people around the world make the fundamental attribution error. This is what the social psychologists would say. I try to tell my students that maybe it's not an error. <laughs> Okay. Yes, absolutely. Yes. Um, whether or not that, again, they're thinking of it as like an internal trait that's immutable or something is, you know, that's a subject for uh, additional inquiry. But Another question. How should traits be parsed or conceptualized? Is it useful to distinguish between motivations, likes, sensitivities, and capacities? For example, likes like aesthetic appreciation or disgust sensitivity, or capacities such as intelligence and creativity? Does it make sense to distinguish between these different kinds of traits or not? We haven't heard from Yulia in a little bit. <laughs> so what, do you, like what do you think? <laughs> I, I have to think about this question for a little bit longer. I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I, I would just say that um, it depends on what your purpose is um, with all of these things. What, what are you trying to predict or understand, uh, describe or explain? And depending upon your purpose, it might be very useful to have strong borders between abilities and traits. Uh, whereas 
if you're not, if you're trying to be have a comprehensive model of individual differences more broadly, um, you need to integrate those. I think um, I had mentioned earlier, you know, political beliefs and political attitudes being paired up with personality, um, I think has been useful um, and morality more generally being uh, trying to attempt to cleave that into some evolutionary and personality related domains has been useful. Um, so at times it's good to put it, put them together and mix them up, but there could be times when you want walls between those constructs. Is it a good idea to look at personality types without looking at the adaptive functional personality itself in our evolutionary environment? I'm not sure what this person means by personality itself, but what do you think? No. Is there something like personality itself without the individual differences? Can you talk about personality without talking about personality types? Yeah, the phrase personality types is a red flag for personality psychologists in terms of, uh, you know, we just tend not to think, um, well, not everyone, some, some are looking, you know, using latent class analysis and other techniques to see if there are configurations of personality that might be typological. But in general, uh, most personality research is dimensional um, and multifactorial. And so we tend not to think of types, but that might not be exactly what they mean um, in that question. Let's see. Um, there's a question that asks whether the diversity of personality types might contribute to a society in positive ways. Um, and the question includes an example. A German team showed ant colonies tend to succeed when they contain a balance between workers that focus on colony defense and those spending their time nurturing their young. Have evolutionary psychologists consider how our very personalities might contribute to population success? So this is maybe a, a group selection perspective. So do some groups that have a particular mix of personalities do better than other groups that have a different mix of personalities? I mean, it probably depends on what you mean with do better. So <laughs> what, how do we define success here? So maybe competition in competition between groups, for example. I would say yes, probably then some groups would do better than others um, when it comes to competition. Um, so might be better for these groups to uh, have more people that are more like successful in competitions, which might be related to their personality traits, such as um, yeah, competitiveness, of course, extraversion is related to competitiveness and to um, striving for social hierarchy, for example. Uh, I think a more different way to think of the question might be, um, I'm not, uh, I'm not a, a group selectionist, um, so I, you know, kind of thing, but I can imagine that it may be places or, you know, societies or something like that, of course, you don't know cause and effect, maybe better off with kind of a, just a diversity of personality in general, so lots of different kinds of people, so instead of everyone going after the same thing, you have lots of people going after lots of different things, and it may just make living in bigger groups uh, more feasible. Um, then again, um, humans don't have as many personality factors, if you believe the big five, um, as do chimpanzees um, or uh, <clears throat> as do chimpanzees or bonobos, but they have as many personality factors as orangutans. I should just preface, I'm waiting to hear back on a manuscript in which we administer this chimpanzee scale to a bunch of humans and we get the big five more or less. Um, not chimpanzee, but the, the primate scale. So it may just be, you know, not so much a question of whether some groups composed of some, you know, some groups composed of some different types of people are better, 
but just that you know if groups are too homogenous, it might be um, problematic, or you know, you know. So that's a just a you know thought. I have no evidence to back that um, <laughs> suggestion. But maybe a different way to ask that question is to ask whether populations that have particular personality. Uh, mixes do better in particular environments in which they find themselves. For, for example, there is some research on animal personalities that shows that the populations that first move into a new environment, so the, the individuals that colonize a new environment, tend to have particular personality types, which are instrumental in exploring, colonizing, adapting to a new environment. So this has been demonstrated in various animal species, and I believe there's some data from humans I don't know how well established these data are showing that people who live in small islands tend on average to have some differences in the personalities uh, when compared to people from the mainland. Um, what comes to mind for me with this question is, so Simon Baron Cohen uh, has, has done a lot of work on uh, uh, in characterizing social cognitive foundations of autism and uh, the, you know, the, extreme male brain theory and empathizing, systemizing and all these, all these things. But uh, in his new book, he, uh, his new book on, on this topic is called The Pattern Seekers, I believe. Um, and it's, it's about how the people who are essentially on the autism spectrum in the tech world in Silicon Valley, uh, you know, the sort of, you know, including and up to and including Elon Musk and, and people like that, um, you know, are making these uh, gigantic contributions to the national and global economy and just the human welfare in general through their contributions to technology. Um, and so that would be an, uh, that would be a, a straightforward example of a situation in which having different types of people with different types of orientations and ways of, uh, you know, making contributions is is beneficial at the at the population level and possibly even in this case, the species level, although uh, please don't start commenting about species, uh, good of the species argument. <laughs> Yeah, I should probably expand on what I said previously, um, just to take into account what the other said, because it's absolutely right. So if we just look at um, what is better in comparison to a different group, um, for example, if we focus on competition, it doesn't necessarily mean that everybody in what group should be high on extraversion or on competitiveness, because we also have to look at how the group functions, how, how the people are interacting with each other. And I think nobody um, would be really happy in this group if everybody is high on extroversion and everybody puts all his resources to a fight for so social hierarchy or something like that. So there should also be people and with a more diverse like spectrum of, of extroversion who then say, okay, I don't care about um, being the leader of this group and the whole group might benefit more of a diversity and personality. So I think we have about five minutes left. Let's see if we can answer a couple more questions from the audience. One is this, what do you see as the link between difference detecting adaptations of person perception and the human nature architecture of the mind? Who wants to try with this question? <laughs> Maybe we need to unpack this question. Well, so this is uh, <laughs> this is a question from David, and uh, and I I mean uh, D David knows what I think about this, but um, well, uh, share you know, it with uh, everybody. The, <laughs> what David means by difference detecting um, adaptations is uh, is you know this heuristic. Uh, psychology, this heuristic evolved psychology that allows us to uh, make probabilistic inferences about other people's behavioral tendencies um, for the purpose of uh, predicting or communicating about uh, those behavioral tendencies, um, which is a useful thing to be able to do. Um, and uh, so what I think, and um, what I think David agrees with, is that uh, the folk uh, behavioral description concepts that are produced by these difference detecting adaptations um, are very useful, they're very functional, um, and they do actually track real patterns of phenotypic variation in other people. They, they couldn't have evolved if they didn't do that in some way uh, effectively that allowed you to achieve greater than chance accuracy in behavioral prediction of other people. Um, but what I also think is that using those, those folk concepts, 
uh, as uh, a window into the mechanisms on the other side that actually regulate the behaviors being produced um, uh, you know, and, and described, I think that that is where things um, break down a lot. Um, and, and you can't assume, for example, that a given behavioral description concept isn't referring to the outputs of 12 different uh, behavioral regulation systems in different instances and in different individuals or whatever. Um, and uh, you also can't assume that the correlations among the, uh, those, those folk uh, heuristic uh, uh, difference detecting concepts, um, uh, you know, uh, map onto a cleanly functionally defined dimension of variation, although in some cases uh, they they may. Um, so in the in the hexaco uh, uh, factor model, but not the big five hack factor model, um, the outputs of of the recalibrational system of anger um, variation in, in that system um, produces outputs that align very closely with agreeableness, but only in the hexaco space, not in the big five space, for example. Um, so, anyways, uh, that's. That's why the goal is to predict other individuals' behavior. I'm not sure that using uh, behavioral descriptors or attributing things like personality is even necessary because animals do this very well. For example, mm -hmm. monkeys are very effective at predicting the behavior of other monkeys just based on observation and learning. Domestic dogs are very good at predicting their owner's uh, behavior. They don't talk about it. They don't attribute personality profiles, they just observe and record and remember and extrapolate. Uh, uh, if I could just add to what you're just saying, Dario, I don't think it's person perception. I think it's behavioral perception, period. And I say this on the basis of if you just look at, say, like an item by item level, so then you're not aggregating across multiple traits, the iterator reliability of individual ratings of human personality is about 0.33. It's you know, work by Renee Modis. And I've not done the meta-analysis yet because I don't have a sabbatical to do it. But if I were to guesstimate what the ICCs were of the items, because I compute them for, you know, I compute them and publish them and all that fun stuff of the animal stuff. If I were to guess what the, the average of that was, it'd be about 0.33. And then there's the paper by, um, um, Alison Bell's, I think the senior author, and I can't remember who the first author is, on looking at repeatability of behavior. So not perception here, but just how consistent is behavior in various animals. 0.35, I think it was. So there's this very, very, you know, consistent, you know, you've got a consistent amount of stability in behavior, and you've got about that same sort of, you know, ability to perceive behavior. So I think this is just a much more general mechanism than just trying to get at you know, what a person is, is doing. So uh, I'm gonna step in now, we're uh, at time and uh, sorry to break up a, a wonderful discussion. Uh, I first wanna thank real quick, the other committee members who helped organize this. I made a major faux pas and forgot to thank them at the beginning. So thank you, Courtney, Paul, and Saeed, who helped put this together. And thank you, our wonderful panelists, for that great discussion. Uh, there was nice to see a lot of uh, disagreement and agreement on, on various issues. So that was great. Uh, our next topic is next month. We'll release more information about that soon. And then I just want to remind all the HMS members here that this space is available to you 24-7. So if you ever want to hook up with other HMS members and uh, talk shop or whatever, feel free to come into the OEA and use the, the social rooms. Uh, it's open 24-7. Again, thank you, everyone, and I uh, hope you enjoyed the discussion. Thank you.